in the Silicon Valley at the Motorola office and uh, hello, so who are you? My name's Steve McDonnell, I'm the director of the Mods ecosystem here at Motorola. And uh, who are you over there? Oh, my name is Christian Flowers, I'm a member of the systems architecture team and the Moto Mods ecosystem team here at Motorola Mobility. And you are, uh, are you in uh, Chicago? Yes. All right. So um, you have the Moto Z right here, um, Indeed. which is a very innovative product. So can you describe a little bit how it's designed, how it's made? Yeah, I mean, basically what happened is a bunch of really smart engineers at Motorola in Chicago uh, looked at the mobile phone and decided that they wanted to make it a lot thinner. And by making it thinner, they were also going to provide a very new model um, for attaching extra accessories to the phone and really truly beyond accessories. So this is crazy thin. How, it is. I mean, this is the thinnest high-end phone in the world, right? I believe it is. This is, uh, are we talking five point something millimeters? Oh, Christian. Well, I don't have the specs in front of me, <laughs> but... Yeah, I think it was 5.2 or something. There you go. I'm going to trust it, you on this. On but that. that's that's and so how does it? Uh, how did they make it so thin? Like the oh, battery is like made the, the battery much thinner. I believe there's some liquid cooling going on in there. Um, you can imagine that they basically went all the way back to the drawing board and looked at what they could do to make to take some thickness off the device. And truly, the reason for that is so you can do this. So you can just easily dock, like, it's, is it fully magnetic? How's the system? Where, where are the magnets? Oh, <laughs> that's part of the secret sauce. There are definitely magnets involved. Um, does you know, various I, I connectors, guess this, this these pins here, this little locator. Um, all that's really very important for the way that the, the um, accessory or the mods attach to the phone. So um, those connectors down there, it's is called Grey Boss, right? Um, and, and how does that work? What's the bandwidth and all that stuff? So Graybus is the, the protocol that gives you the ability to hot swap and to essentially extend device drivers uh, that are actually located on a separate piece of hardware up into the Linux kernel. And they appear to the Linux kernel on the Moto Z like those devices are locally attached. Uh, the bandwidth varies. It depends on uh, which interface you're using. So over those 16 pins, uh, we actually support a variety of a very, fairly powerful interfaces. So um, I can do uh, a CSI camera at, um, you know, 10, uh, I'm sorry, 13 megapixel at 60 frames a second. Uh, at the same time that I'm doing. Oh, the bandwidth, are you still there? Yeah, it okay. just <laughs> Froze, does it automatically reconnect or is it, it going to come back? It does. All right. It so, all gets itself out. I mean, but I think one of the important things to talk about at this point even is when you talk about throughput, what you're essentially doing is with this speaker, it now has access to raw digital audio directly from the device. Raw digital so, audio. Yeah. We can, there's a, so there's a raw line that it can get access to. So that's higher quality than Bluetooth potentially, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Now, what that means is that when I attach this, I'm not just attaching an accessory to the phone. I'm adding a new speaker to the phone. This is now the phone speaker. And this is the highest quality, loudest speaker in a phone ever. So far as I'm aware, but remember, never heard and you're phone. absolutely, and you make, and you, you, you're along the right lines there. This is not an additional Bluetooth speaker or something like that. This is now this phone speaker. In the same way, if I put, you know, a battery on there. This now intelligently works with the phone. You know, I can see. Should we click on try again to get him back or? Yeah, or, you can. Yeah. Which one is that? Hmm. Let's see if hopefully he comes back automatically. Oh, wait, did I grab the wrong control? Yeah. Just gonna. This is this is really cool on the projector, uh, TIDLP Pico projector. Sorry, Hi, you're back. So you you were talking about the gray bus, and you were saying that bandwidth varies. But are you talking about is this the same bandwidth as if the hardware was like on the PCB inside? Uh, 
Uh, yes, that's a true. Uh, that's largely a true statement. So, Christian, uh, the the example I was just giving that is that you know by attaching this speaker to the phone, I'm mm -hmm. not putting an accessory on the phone. I'm adding a new speaker to the phone. This speaker now has access to the to the data in the phone in the same way as we'd actually as if we'd actually built this speaker in. So whatever the fastest format we can move audio around on the phone, this speaker now has access to it. it doesn't have to go through Bluetooth, it doesn't have to go through Wi-Fi or any kind of other connection process. It is now this phone speaker. And and uh, so this is hot swappable technology. Yes. Th this is like uh, uh, this some kind of safety in terms of like not corrupting anything in the Android. I guess you modify the Android to support this, or has this? Yes, we did. So there's like uh, uh, advanced uh, customization of how or very what's it called efficient in integration of this technology in, in the way Android works. Uh, yes, we did a we did a lot of work to ensure that we uh, we integrated with Android well, so it was seamless. So audio is a perfect example. Uh, when you're using audio devices, and you could you could expose yourself as a multitude of devices, um, and the 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 audio device types, for instance, match the Android device types one for one. That means that if you tell the uh, tell Moto Z, I am a loudspeaker. It will route loudspeaker audio to your Moto Mod as opposed to your phone's loudspeaker. And these are dynamic devices as well. So now if I plug in a headset, your Moto Mod would inform the Moto Z, hey, my audio device is now a loudspeaker and a headset. The Moto Z's standard routing would say, well, a headset takes priority over your loudspeaker. And because this headset's on the Moto Mod, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it out to the Moto Mod. So there's one example of just how it's integrated really tightly uh, and not every instance actually requires an Android application along with it. And so, uh, for example, uh, there's multi-display because you kind of output the, the mirror display on the projector, right? And you could have a, another display outside. Yes. So if you're aware of, of, of Android and the operating system and the APIs they provide, we added uh, displays in as an Android secondary display. Uh, which means that any application gets mirroring for free. And if application actually wants something custom on that secondary display, they they use the Android presentation class, right, standard API, and they can now provide custom content on that second display that is unique from the content that their application would just provide on the primary phone screen. So there's extended display and mirror display. There's uh, optional different different things in there. I guess, yes. and, and the, the, the apps APIs can easily hook into that. If you want to do an app that, let's say, uh, outputs something different, uh, like an ebook on an e-ink display outside, and then on the main Android, you keep having your normal Android phone. Uh, well, not quite to that degree. It's the frontmost, when you're talking to the display class, um, you're showing it's the frontmost application. So. Uh, an e-ink application that's an e-reader would probably be implemented in a different manner. All right. So there's uh, there's display, there's data, and there's power, um, and all that goes uh, smoothly. Why do you need all these pins? So what do they all do? The, uh, the si was it 16 pins? 16 pins. Well, so we've got um, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, a couple of ground pins, because grounding is pretty important. Uh, we have a, a, a pin that allows the Moto Mod to power itself from the phone. Uh, there is one pin that's dedicated to um, uh, charging power back and forth. Um, we've got a pin dedicated to uh, a large amount of the command and control and signaling between the two Moto Mod, uh, the Moto Mod and the Moto Z. Um, Four of those pins are a, a phi. So over those five pins, you could either run uh, raw USB 3.1, raw I squared S, or if you're using that Moto high speed bridge, I can do CSI camera and DSI video and USB 2.0 and I squared S audio, all in parallel simultaneously. 
This sounds Beyond that, we've also got another USB interface and a mobility display port interface. Display port. So that's the that's the standard that goes through for the display? That's one of them, yes. The other one would be DSI, which is more for embedded devices. Uh, display port would be really good for a dock type implementation where you're plugging in something external. And it seems uh, very stable and, and reliable. When you when you dock it, you just know it works, right? When you when you put it in the, on the phone, you put it on the phone. You get a nice connection tone, a nice animation that lets you know it's there and ready to use. Uh, so and yes, because of the, the magnets and and the alignment pin, um, and frankly, the hard work that we did with the mechanicals, they they line up nicely. They almost just fall into place. Uh, that's totally awesome. So you have a uh, four, about four, a few, maybe uh, four, like uh, introduction kind of like uh, moto mods. And now you're talking about expanding this. You are expanding this to hackathons and to Indiegogo, and you are encouraging all developers to to, uh, to participate yeah. in this ecosystem. So really, the the initial devices that came out are to prove the market. Um, obviously, we want people to be able to buy a mod, you know, when they buy their phone. But the real big play here is opening this up to a broader ecosystem. And truly, what we want to do is encourage an ecosystem. So, you know, earlier you were talking about the idea of adding Bluetooth to the speaker. I think that's a great idea, but I really hope that somebody out in the world does that. Um, potentially, it could be JBL. Potentially, it could be somebody else. Um, there's a lot of ideas that, that are out in the world that need to be you know, developed. And we, we hope that people will, will do that. We've created the, uh, the MDK in order to eliminate a lot of the barriers um, to getting to, um, you know, a prototype. So the idea here is essentially, this is just mostly an emptied out uh, mod. So with all the connectors and gray bus and all those sorts of things that you need. Um, and then you can add whatever type of card you need to. Um, to define what sorts of things or aligned with what sorts of things you want to do. What kind so of that's, card is this? This is just the perforated board. Um, so you can kind of add whatever sensors or whatever you wanted to add to that. Um, so you would put the, the, you could connect some cables in each of those holes? Yeah. Like sensors, a, cables, you know, whatever it might be. With a, with a what's it called, a, the iron, uh, you would uh, solder yeah. some, some cables to it, right? Yep, absolutely. But, you know, here's one that's already got um, a lot of the... It's actually got the battery in it. You can see that there. So this is one that you would snap in and it would have a battery personality already. So you can look at adding other things to that if you want to, LED or something like that. Um, you might... You know, I think there's a lot of room for battery plus one type solutions out in the world. So battery plus memory would be an interesting one for people to work on, I think. But I don't know, battery plus an RFID reader, battery plus... a you know, who knows? A single button that allows you to turn your lights on when you've got you lights at home or something like that. Um, so that's a battery card. Uh, this one's an audio one. So that just pops in there. And now I've got a speaker that I can start working with. Um, What's key to point out is we give you the full electrical schematics, the full firmware, and where there's an application involved, the full application that runs on Android. We give all of this open source. So you can use those to learn, like, oh, how does battery charging work and how do I control this uh, to prototype so you can kind of get your project going and understand how does the platform work and what do I want to do with it? Uh, so really with the MDK, uh, the Moto Mods development kit, you know, not only can you work on that perforated board and solder your solution down, and the reason we have the perforated boards is so you can reuse that reference Moto Mod again and again. You're not ruining it with just one solder project and, oh, I've got all these wires and I can't clean it up. Right. I, this is a reusable prototype board. Very much so. You can use it for you know, display, for audio. You can switch these all in and out, use it for a number of different things, put it together any number of um, perforated boards you want to use. This is the, the Raspberry Pi hat board. Um, so this would allow you to attach... Obviously, this goes into the mod, and then you can attach your Raspberry Pi projects directly to that and start using those you know, with drivers and software that you'd have to develop for the phone. So if you have a Raspberry Pi project, what do you need to modify or adapt to have it like, show up on, on the Moto Z? 
like to, for it to work. It'd have to be the right kind of project right off the bat. But go yeah. ahead, Christian. You have to write firmware. So from a hardware standpoint, you're done. Right? You can just slap the hat on and it's existing working hardware. Now, depending on what's on there, you'll have to write I squared C, spy drivers, right? You'll have to write audio drivers if it's an audio hat. So it really depends on what the Raspberry Pi hat is. Um, but from a, a hardware standpoint, you're largely done. Attach it, plug it in, wipe your hands and walk away. Uh, but you do have to develop firmware and it's likely that the sensors that you choose or the what are on there uh, aren't currently supported in NUTX and you will have to write that initial firmware. NUTX is the operating system, the embedded operating system that Moto Mods run on. Graybus is a protocol that runs as a layer on top of that. And then developers actually develop device drivers that sit on Graybus. So you never actually have to contend with the complexities of the communication back and forth and interrupts and everything else. You just write a device driver and you get callbacks uh, that come up the stack. What's the ModX? Is that like a very small OS that runs on a microcontroller on the... Yes, it's an, it's an open source RTOS. Um, you know, very standard interfaces like POSIX APIs, uh, flexible scheduling, round robin, interrupt, you know, uh, but it's essentially, it's a, it's a nice lightweight real-time operating system. It needs to be able to just instantly boot up when, as soon as you connect the Moto mod and, and instantly be uh, super stable and everything, right? Actually, what's neat is if your Moto mod has a battery in it, it might never turn off. But uh, so typically, if a model, Moto Mod has a battery, even when detached, uh, it's still powered and running to an extent. But uh, you're right; it needs to be very fast. So if it was in an off state, say it doesn't have a battery, you needed to uh, get powered up, get initialized, to get enumerated quickly, right? Otherwise, this would be a frustrating experience. So could you add uh, with the Moto Mod? You could add a modem. Could you add white spaces? Different kind of connectivity. Yeah, external kind of like processing, extra processor somehow. Uh, does that um, make any sense? You, you could add a modem. Uh, at that point, you would really just look like a, a USB um, data connection. Um, uh, you would want to be a um, a device at that point, uh, from a USB standpoint, not a host. Uh, so you could do modems. Uh, carriers might not be necessarily excited by it. Uh, but it is possible to provide another data path. Uh, All right. Beyond that, um, uh, I think what were some of the examples you threw? Other examples you threw out there? Uh, I was thinking adding more processing power or something. I don't know, some external uh, a second processor that does something else. If it's if it's fairly custom, then yeah. you could. Um, but uh, you know, Android's not just going to. Uh, by default, offload some processing power. It would need to be something pretty custom. Um, one good example would be if you were doing a camera uh, and your camera had an ISP on it. Right? So that's a, that'd be a case where you'd have a, a second processor. You're adding processor power, essentially. Um, yeah, because the, the Hasselblad camera you have is pretty, it looks pretty great. So how, what's the quality on that? How does that work? There's like, uh, it's zoom, it's real zoom. The big thing, the big thing that's added is uh, mechanical zoom or physical zoom. So instead of, uh, or I think they call it optical zoom. Because yeah. every phone today uses, every mobile phone camera yeah. uses uh, digital zoom, um, which right has its limitations. Yeah. Isn't there? And, and so, but potentially you could have like a camera made that, that would have 4K, super high quality. Uh, so there would be an ISP in the camera to add that kind of, so suddenly your phone becomes, like a high-end camera, like not just like a smartphone camera. Yes. So that's that's possible. And so uh, you are. Um, what, what is it? What is the relation you have with Indiegogo? How how do you encourage projects in Indiegogo? Indiegogo is a campaign we announced uh, very recently, two weeks ago, I think. Um, and we're working with Indiegogo to foster the ecosystem. We've introduced the MDK to make it easier to get to a hardware prototype. The next step is how do we actually help people get to market? Um, and how do we help these ideas flourish? 
Um, and how do we help the ecosystem flourish, truly? Um, and, and obviously, uh, Indiegogo is a big player in that space already. The whole idea of crowdfunding um, is increasingly important. And I think this gives our customers an opportunity to vote about what kinds of mods they'd like to see. But essentially, from a, a partner point of view or from the ecosystem point of view, we've launched uh, with Indiegogo the Transform Your Smartphone Challenge. Um, and the goal there is for people to submit their ideas and how they hope to get to market, you know, a little bit about their business case, their team, those sorts of things. They send that information over to us. We've already got hundreds of entries um, and we're going through those now. Christian's helping with some of that. Um, <clears throat> we look at those, we evaluate them, you know, what's technically possible, what addresses customer pain points, you know, what is commercially viable, um, what is an interesting use of mods? Um, evaluate all those, and we'll be sending out a Motorola Z um, and an MDK with a kit of the uh, personality cards. We'll be sending that out to the winners who qualify, and those people will have as much time as they need. Well, not as much time as they need. They'll have till early January 2017 to have their project ready. Um, all those projects will go live on Indiegogo um, on our landing page, the Transform the Smartphone Challenge page, and people will start funding them. Um, in early March, we're going to take some of those top programs, the most funded programs, um, about 10 of those, and take them off to Chicago, and we're going to do a Shark Tank event. We're going to have Lenovo Capital there, Verizon, Verizon Ventures, obviously Motorola, um, and we'll be evaluating those companies for potential distribution, investment, um, and then beyond that, you know, how can we help them get to market um, with you know, relationships, introductions, those sorts of things. So um, uh, there's a potential, and there's a potential that there will be some motor mods you, you haven't even thought of right now. I hope so. That would <laughs> That'd that be would, great. <laughs> that would be completely revolutionary for, this, for the smartphone industry, right? Fingers crossed. This is what potentially is going to happen right now. There Absolutely. There might be some, some, uh, some, some people with an amazing idea and it just makes sense and yep. it just changes the way you use the smartphone. Obviously, there's a lot of smart people at Motorola. This couldn't have happened if there weren't a lot of smart people, you know, building amazing things. But we don't have every smart person in the world. We know there's a lot of smart people outside Motorola as well. So we really have done everything we can to empower an ecosystem to do exactly what you're saying, to come up with something we've never thought of. We, we, we could not be more excited with that possibility. And you, you have a, a confirmed that the next generation will fit all the motor mods, right? Yeah, it's yeah, future yeah. proof, right? Yeah, yeah, we've um, we definitely committed to multiple generations maintaining this attachment architecture, you know, the software and um, hardware um, connections. Um, we're very much locking a, a lot of that detail in so we have multiple generations um, of phones supporting this architecture. Like, uh, I think Mar Marcus Brownlee, he was saying he'd like to, a high quality DAC audio with a headphone jack. That, that could be one more to mod. You should right? get on with that. And then, uh, yeah. Good. The, the, I'd like to see e-ink. I'd like to see uh, some other kind of displays on the back, uh, uh, maybe a laptop dock or some other ideas. But I'm guessing oh, over those hundred, you already have some pretty... Uh, we do. Uh, exciting... <laughs> Uh, submissions already. We do, we do. Right? Yes. Unfortunately, I can't talk about them because they're people's uh, business proposals. Um, but so very soon you'll start hearing about them. In early January, um, I think you'll you'll start seeing those and can start funding them. I'm just going to throw some ideas out. Like solar panels, mm -hmm. you could have uh, just a second display, like a normal display in the back, mm -hmm. or you can have. Uh, oh, there's so much potential. <laughs> there's so much. There really is. I mean, again, the idea is that. You know, I'm attaching now my phone's projector. You know, plug and play, it all just works. Now I don't want a projector, I want a speaker. Now I want a battery. Now I want solar charging. Now I want whatever it is. Remember the experience when you first started playing with apps on your phone and all the freedom that you got? Because suddenly you could address the specific thing that you needed to be able to do. What we're doing with this development is doing the same thing with hardware. So now your phone is exactly what you need it to be. It's got as much battery as you need. It's got 
like some kind of sensor that you need because you need to be able to measure infrared light or whatever it might be. Um, it's got a better camera because you personally care about photography and you want to be able to zoom in. It's got a better speaker because that's what you care about. But the person next to you doesn't care about photography, so they don't need that better speaker So again, or that better camera. So again, we go away from that incremental, very general approach that's been happening with smartphones where it's one size fits all. We'll keep trying to make it smaller and a better camera, but that's really all we can do. By opening this up, we create an environment where the world is your oyster. The limitations are the imagination. And truly, we're going to see an appification of these mods um, and what we can do with phones. Potentially, point of sale, there could be like sure. fingerprint rate, uh, like some. Uh, they We've could got be, a fingerprint rate. <laughs> yeah, but there could be a, another one where, where it would be like used for a border control, like a passport, where they have those. Or they can have, uh, you can have card readers for credit card payments. Well, we think there's a lot of, I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of consumer opportunities, but there are B2B and, you know, really interesting um, enterprise solutions as well. Because, I mean, don't forget, everybody who works in the enterprise also probably has a phone. <laughs> so everybody's a consumer to some extent or another. But in terms of, you know, a very focused enterprise solution, a lot of the times you see somebody having to build a phone in order to put their special solution on top of it, you know, an RFID scanner or a barcode scanner or whatever it might be, some kind of comms or a card reader. You know, now you can start with a, a fully powered, you know, modern smartphone and then attach whatever you need to it to do that specific thing. So if you need a solution that only does one thing, if it's not a consumer-oriented approach, you can also begin with a smartphone and then attach what you need, the, the reader, the whatever it might be. Like healthcare, a mobile, healthcare. A yeah. mobile little uh, like hospital with all the sensors people need to, I don't know, measure blood, glucose, all these sure. different things. There's so much potential right here. So it's 5.5 inch. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm a, like a, I'm a, I've, I've been addicted to the six inch. It would have been awesome, but that, who's, who knows? Maybe they could be like a different size in the future. That, oh. But for sure, the 5.5 is going to continue for multiple generations. Uh, definitely these connectors are going to continue. So the architecture at the back, um, we're going to keep that um, for, you know, for at least for a while. But certainly we'll have multiple generations of phones supporting the current um, mods um, system. That, that's awesome. There's a lot of potential. Maybe, uh, who knows, maybe you, you open the system up to in, invite other players in the industry, connect with your mods, maybe. Never say know. never. Never say never. Who, who knows? That's, <laughs> There's just... a lot of opportunities, as you say. All right. It's very rich. All right. And there's, uh, there's a lot of reviews already, and people are quite excited with your phone, right? Uh, what, like, what, what is media saying, do you think? I think they're saying super encouraging things. I mean, I think everybody loves the size of the phone. So you can just start with the phone by itself. But, you know, this concept of what's beyond the current, you know, smartphone is truly, we're, we're beginning that conversation. Now, there were other players, you know, Project Ara was around and that, that was Google's approach. I would say that was a much less consumer oriented type approach. Um, LG had their friends. Um, that wasn't plug and play. I don't think that was a really, again, it wasn't taken from the, con the point of view of the consumer and the experiences they want to have. This really is a whole new language around the way phones work, I think. Um, and we're, we're, we're at the beginning, I hope, of a revolution about what the smartphone is. And Project Arrow was an open, uh, open source uh, project and it kind of gave you some technology right here, right? It gave you a, a grey bus, right? We certainly pursued some of the, their innovations, yeah. And we've added back to that as well. So, you know, all of the, like I said, we were, we were based on the NUTX RTOS, uh, that legacy from ARA, and all of the changes that we've done to add new protocols uh, or to, uh, you know, further shore up the grey bus protocol, uh, you know, we've pushed those back to open source. Those are available on GitHub. Uh, as well as all of the kernel changes in Linux. Uh, those have been pushed to open source as well. Uh, the, the only thing that's really proprietary that we don't share are our changes in the Android framework to integrate these ModoMod devices into Android and make it really that seamless experience that you get. All right, but uh, I mean, who knows what happens in the future? Maybe you, you want to push this even more to make it like the new standard for smartphones. I'm just thinking, who knows? Uh, mm -hmm. Try to, 
encourage everybody to you know follow your lead in, in doing some innovation well certainly uh and I think that, that, as I say, anything is possible, but the key now is really to foster a successful ecosystem. And that's why we're doing the crowdfunding campaign with Indiegogo. And that's why we've also announced um, our first two hackathons. Um, we're doing our first hackathon in December in New York and our second one in January in San Francisco. Um, I'm sure there can be a link with some dates and that sort of thing. Um, so how so long is a few days or a couple two, two day hackathons? Two days? You know the, the standard start on Saturday morning, set some challenges, and because of the MDK and the capabilities that that it provides, people will have a working prototype on Saturday on Sunday, and we'll be looking at those um, for a variety of prizes, but also you know potential funding, potential distribution, all those sorts of things as well. How can we help those people get to market? That's awesome. So uh, and this is this is the the this is the vision statement. Of Motorola to, to provide a custom custom uh, technology right for uh, digital life for everybody right so this is it this is the, the, the next level after Moto Maker you were doing before where people just customizing colors and stuff right now they're customizing the the, the motor mods the technology it's absolutely a logical extension of, of everything that people have wanted from their phone for a while. And, it's, and again, I, I start with the idea of applications because I think that was one of the first places that people were truly, really customizing what their phone was about by putting their own apps on there to do measurement, to do expense tracking, whatever it is you need to do. That was when we first started going, wow, my phone can be whatever I need it to be. Um, you know, I think the physical customization um, in terms of, you know, different backs and that sort of thing is really, that's a personal, you know, preference, a matter of taste. And, and there's, we have style shelves that allow you to do that as well with the same connector. Um, but then beyond that, really adding true functionality. Yes, this is an extension of allowing people to have a smartphone that fully integrates into their digital life and with the various other aspects of their digital life as well. So this is uh, this is so awesome. I guess in, in, in Chicago, maybe also here in Silicon Valley, you have some amazing engineers working on this, right? You have a pretty cool team of crazy experts in the it's smartphone the business, right? Is that where you are? That, that Those are the kinds of guys you work with? Oh yeah, they're all behind me in a lab right now. And so that's pretty cool. And uh, so now I'm hoping that the marketing is, is gonna uh, go in the direction of selling millions and millions of these. We absolutely hope so. Well. On November 3rd, I think it was, we started a, a new TV campaign, which I love personally, because it is definitely very different to anything we've done previously. Um, and I think that uh, there's more to come around that. Cool, thanks a lot for showing off this awesome innovation. My pleasure, thanks for coming along.